page 24. Whoever realizes that the six senses aren't real, that the five aggregates are fictions, that no such things can be located anywhere in the body, understands the language of Buddhas, 24. Sutras say, the cave of five aggregates, the five skandhas, is the hall of Zen. The opening of the inner eye is the door of the great vehicle. What could be clearer? So, whoever realizes that the six senses, six senses are eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, mind. Whoever realizes that eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, mind aren't real, and that the five aggregates, form, feelings, perceptions, impulses, consciousness, are fictions. Yeah, form. Form. You think this form is real. You think that up is up and down is down. You think it's real. You think this is, this is down, this is up. But as I always tell people, it's very easy to play with that. Spin around in a circle. Then up and down, which you think are, it's just based on thinking. When your thinking is stable, that reality is stable. If you spin around and 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 around, then up and down are not clear. You can fall down. Left and right, no longer clear. Even someone's form when your head passes by is not clear. So, when you realize that this form is a fiction, feelings, yeah, feelings are a fiction. You think feelings are real. When you feel it, you think it's real. But it changes. So it doesn't have any independent reality. But you think it's real, some feelings. So you act on it. You depend upon it. You rely upon it. You make decisions based upon it. You run away from a feeling, a bad feeling, or a, a scary feeling, or a nervous feeling. A worry feeling, a jealous feeling. But it's not real. It's not real. It's a fiction. So form is a fiction. Feeling is a fiction. Form, feelings. Perceptions are fictions. Anyone who has gotten drunk sometime on alcohol or something like that knows that. Anyone who has been really tired sometime knows that. Your perception of time and space is a fiction. Form, feelings, perceptions, impulses. That means karma. That means karma. Up. You think your up is real. But it's just a fiction. It's like a shadow. Yeah, a shadow looks real, but it's still just a shadow. Oh, John, your karma is just a shadow. Because you think it's real, you act according to it. Then make more shadows. But it's not real. Form, feelings, perceptions, impulses, which is karma, and consciousness. Consciousness. Any doctor can tell you that consciousness is a fiction. If I hit you hard enough, you could, oh. Where's consciousness then? Sometimes someone, someone in this room, someone you drink, drink alcohol, drink alcohol, drink alcohol, drink, alcohol, drink, 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 Oh, pilum gunase. Right? Pilum gunajata. You have consciousness, but the consciousness is not real. Just some water substance. Some water substance makes this great consciousness disappear. And the next day, everything not so clear. So, form, feelings, perceptions, impulses, consciousness is a fiction. Actually, it's a fiction, fundamentally. It's very temporary. It's very, very, very lightly held together. Very lightly held together. 
You know when you get a cold, when you get a cold, when you can't, when you can't smell, when you can't smell and you can't taste, and you're hearing. You know when you can't smell and you can't taste, also your consciousness becomes different. It becomes different. So it's like plastic. It's like it can just be moved around. So let's look at that again. Whoever realizes that the six senses aren't real, that the five aggregates are fictions, that no such things can be located anywhere in the body, form, feelings, perceptions, impulses, consciousness, cannot be found in the body, understands the language of Buddhas. The sutras say, the cave of form, feelings, perceptions, impulses, consciousness, is the hall of Zen. We practice inside of form, feelings, perceptions, impulses, consciousness. Not separate from them. We practice in this world of form, in this world of feeling, in this world of perception, in this world of karma, in this world of consciousness. We practice in that place. But the opening of the inner eye is the door of the great vehicle. So not this eye. The opening of our inner eye. That is the door of the great vehicle. What could be clearer? Not attached to any thinking is Zen. Not attached to any thinking is Zen. Once you know this, then walking, standing, sitting, or lying down, everything you do is meditation. To know that the mind is empty is seeing the Buddha. To realize that mind is empty, that is seeing. The Buddha is not something you see. The Buddha is not an object to see. When you realize your mind is empty, that realization, realizing the mind is empty, that realization is seeing Buddha. That's what seeing Buddha is. It's not seeing an object. It's just realizing the mind is empty. Wake up. Buddhas of the ten directions have no mind. Buddhas of the ten directions have no mind. To see no mind is to see the Buddha. Very simple, very clear, this teaching. Extremely straightforward. To see no mind is to see Buddha. To give up yourself without regret is the greatest charity. To transcend motion and stillness is the highest meditation. Sentient beings keep moving while our hearts stay still. But the highest meditation surpasses that of both sentient beings and our hearts. People who reach such understanding free themselves from all appearances without effort. Freeing from appearances without effort and cure all illnesses without treatment. Such is the power of great Zen. So this is the paragraph to pay attention to right here. Using mind to look for reality is delusion. Using your thinking mind to look for reality is delusion. Not using mind to look for reality is awareness. Very important point. Not using thinking mind, not using your mind to look for reality, that is awareness. That is enlightenment. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. What is DNA? What is DNA? Go ask a doctor. We are the justice survival machine. Yes. Okay, good question. DNA. So the question is... DNA is, a, is kind of God or DNA? Good question. So what is DNA? DNA, uh, according to many scientists, we are a survival machine. We are here to reproduce and reproduce and reproduce and reproduce. Copy, 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 copy. Eat, sleep, sex, eat, sleep, sex, eat, sleep, sex, again. Make another being, then again, 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 again. The question is, then what is DNA? Then we are just a creature of DNA, a machine 
run by DNA. That's true. If you don't see the nature of mind, that is true. We're just a machine for DNA. Scientists all say that. We're a machine. This book that uh, you once talked about, The Selfish Gene. According to many scientific theorists, we are a machine that exists only to pass DNA down through life. We are a machine that just carries, we're not, we're not here to go to school, we don't exist to get a job, we don't exist to get married or fall in love or to travel, we don't exist to study Buddhism, we don't exist to win in the World Cup. I'm sorry. Sometimes we think the main point of our existence is to win in the World Cup. That's also part of the DNA, the kind of capitalist DNA machine. Go, 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 win in the World Cup and buy this. But if, so many people believe that we are, we are a machine, a factory of DNA, created by DNA to pass on DNA. And if you look at life, at the biological thing, the best part of our life is the part when we can make babies. But making babies is passing DNA. Then we, like a flower, disappear. And this DNA continues. That's a very deep instinct. Many theorists say that is the nature of our existence. Richard, Richard Dawkins, I believe, is the theorist. Oxford University, very famous book, The Selfish Gene. Very interesting. Our genes, our DNA, are selfish. They exist and maintain us in order to promote their own survival. There's no other reason. That's a very interesting point. Actually, it's true. At the level of animal existence, it is totally, totally, totally true. However, there's one more point. As a human being, we also have consciousness. So, if you just live without any awareness of mind, without any awareness of this rare, fragile, sacred, unique thing called consciousness, then the DNA replication machine is a totally, completely believable theory. I believe it 100%. That's why I became a However, we're also aware that we do have thinking. Yeah? And our thinking is not automatically determined, right? I can hit you. I don't like you. Bam! An animal, just an animal, if I hit the animal, wants to hit me, wants to bite back. But as we get older, as, as we are more and more complex organization of thinking, animals also have thinking, dogs have thinking, animals have thinking, as uh, a great uh, monk, Doksung Chongnim, Huijusnim, Sujasnim, Soljong Kunsnim, who is now the Huagisa Huijusnim, said to the Weiguksnim Dol recently, he said, animals have thinking. Only difference is they can't express it. You know, he has, there's some dogs that live near his amja at Sudoksa. And he can, you can look at this. One dog has a very sad karma. One dog is always the boss. Any new dog comes, this dog eats the food. Even we put food for this dog and this dog very far away. He won't touch us. He'll go over and eat the other dog's food. To go, hmm, hmm to this new dog. Any guest comes to the temple, first this dog, again this guest comes, then after, next time, but first the dog is showing, I'm here first. I'm here first. So, yeah, dogs have thinking, but cannot express it. And one more, not as complex as our thinking. It's not as complexly ordered. Therefore, it doesn't have self-reflection. But, so, uh, at the level of just animals, if you hit an animal, 
the reaction is just to come back. Also, many humans take this stick, go out onto the street, try it on 10 people. Probably, certainly nine of them, maybe 10, will hit you back. So at the level of just animal existence, that is true. We are a machine for selfish genes. We are, no doubt. At the level of animal, vegetable existence, that's true. However, as your thinking becomes clearer, as your thinking becomes clearer, as I, if I hit you, you go, why? Did, did, did I do something wrong? Or like Jesus said, hit here, then. That's a very important teaching. That cuts this. Then that is something different than just the selfish DNA. Then I step out of my DNA. Through conscious reflection, I am no longer controlled by my DNA, which is fighting or running, fight or flight, we say. Fight or flight. Fighting or running away. That's the DNA basic response. It's just the level of an animal. Animals will only fight back or the and run away. Human beings same. But if you're more developed, more developed consciousness, and we know many developed consciousnesses like Jesus, Buddha, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, people like that, John Lennon, really? Many people like that. Show us a different way. Ah, this happens to me? Oh. Then, I am sorry. Or, how can I change myself? Or, what did I do to you? I will not do that again. So, at that point, it's not just a DNA machine. It's freedom from animal DNA, just the machine. And then we can use DNA to help other beings. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, I can do something. That's a very important point. So that's not just animals. Most human beings live like that. Just living out the impulses of the DNA machine. So is DNA, your question is a very good one, the way you put it, is DNA God? Yes. Better than God. To most people. To most people, DNA is better than God. DNA is the God activity. It controls their life. It's the reason why they exist, biologically, organically, organism-wise. It is. Many scientists say DNA is God. However, if you look at your mind, what am I? Then you see everything is. When you look, what am I? Your thinking stops. When you look, what am I? There's nothing there. I'm good up, sir. That point, before thinking arises, that point, there's nothing there. Then the impulse is not there. The is not there. It's empty. Anger is empty. Fear is empty. Desire is empty. It's just empty it's not there it has no substance then you can freely operate not as a reaction you choose oh i can hit back or oh, I'm, I'm sorry or like jesus said you know when jesus was dying on the cross you know forgive them father they don't know what they're doing he didn't the, you're, you're wrong i'm gonna send you to hell he didn't say that. he said Forgive them. 
Actually, he was talking to himself. Forgive them. They don't know what they do. How many times when someone says something bad about you, really bad, you say, I should forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Then, if you do that, you cut this DNA response, the automatic DNA response, the animal DNA response, the machine-like DNA response, which is to assert power over that situation. You cut that, you return to being human, which is love and compassion. Okay? So, if you look at your mind, DNA is not God. DNA is not power. DNA is not a machine. DNA is nothing. DNA is not DNA. But if you don't look at your mind, then you just function the way DNA tells you to function. Okay? That's a very good question. So, all of it depends upon mind. Not even how much you understand DNA. That won't help you. How much do you see your mind? Then in any situation, yeah, we still get angry. We still get upset. We're human. Some people think that this practice is about making people perfect. I always say over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. It's not about making you perfect. It's about making you free. Then angry time? Yeah, get angry. Any parent must get angry sometimes with their child, with their friend, when your friend doesn't try hard enough. Frustrating. Anyone gets worried. If you didn't worry, you didn't have emotion. Anyone gets sad, we're human. But not attached to that experience. Point, that's the point. Everyone is attached to those experiences, so they're not free. Then sadness is a prison. Worry is a prison. Fear is a prison. Jealousy is a prison. Competition is a prison. But if you see your mind, you see that all of those experiences are there, they're not real, they're not unreal, but they are empty. Don't call them real, don't call them unreal. Look at them. That's the power of meditation. When you sit, what am I? Many things appear and disappear. They appear and disappear. People think meditation means everything stops. It's very perfectly empty. No. See appearing and disappearing. But when you see that appearing is empty and disappearing is empty, if you look at it, then there's no appearing, there's no disappearing. That is freedom. Then you're free when things appear like anger or fear or worry, and you're free when they don't appear or disappear. It's freedom from life and death. It's a very interesting point. Does anyone else have any questions? No questions? Okay, let's continue. Page 28. This is our last point for this lecture series. When you understand, reality depends on you. When you don't understand, you depend on reality. When reality depends on you, that which isn't real becomes real. When you depend on reality, that which is real becomes false. When you depend on reality, everything is false. When reality depends on you, everything is true. Thus, the sage doesn't use his mind to look for reality and doesn't, u- and doesn't use his mind for reality to look for his mind or his mind to look for his mind or reality to look for reality. His mind doesn't give rise to reality And reality doesn't give rise to his mind. And because both his mind and reality are still, he's always in samadhi. Very interesting. Very interesting. So, reality. We have this concept of reality. What is reality? 
What is real? Nowadays we have on TV reality TV. <laughs> reality TV. But if that's reality, oh my goodness, we're in trouble. So we know that that reality is not reality. They call it reality TV, so we'll watch it. But it's not, it's a show. It's not real, it's not true. We understand from reality too, you know, a very tragic story uh, a few days ago in Korea. It said some uh, kyosa, some teacher at a school in uh, the country, in a chodung hakyo, in a grammar school, this teacher on a picnic with the students got drunk. And then he raped a student or sexually abused a student. It's in the newspaper on the internet yesterday. So, before that, he thought everything is reality. This is good, this is bad. Such is good, such is bad. Then he drinks this, got very drunk on this picnic, and then did some bad action. Then, after the alcohol disappeared, oh my gosh, what did I do? So, when you depend upon reality, that's a mistake. Because there's the sober reality, when you would not do that. Then when you get drunk, that's a, another kind of reality to that person. When you're drunk, there's no other reality. You know? That's why people do very stupid things. Because when you're drunk, that's a drunk reality. That's an anything possible reality. That's a kind of freedom, quote unquote, my freedom reality. That's a my feeling reality. You know, you see a drunk person and someone who's not drunk. The drunk person, that's real, that's mine. But the not drunk person, that's a crazy. So this is what Bodhidharma, if you depend upon reality, your construct of reality, you lose. If reality depends upon you, that's interesting. So anyone who's done meditation, really does meditation, really looks inside, attains. Everything is fundamentally empty. Everything is fundamentally empty. And happy time happy. Sad time sad. No attachment. That reality depends upon you. But departing reality or not reality, that's true freedom. So let's look at this again. When you understand, reality depends on you. When you don't understand, you depend on some kind of reality. A sad reality, depressed reality, crazy reality, busy reality. When reality depends on you, that which isn't real becomes real. When you depend on reality, that which is real becomes false. When you depend on reality, everything is false. When reality depends on you, everything is true. Thus, the sage doesn't use his mind to look for reality. Don't use your mind to look for reality. Or reality to look for his mind, or his mind to look for his mind, or reality to look for reality. His mind doesn't give rise to reality. And reality doesn't give rise to his mind. And because both mind and reality are still, which means empty, because mind is empty and reality is empty, he's always in samadhi. So you think your reality is real. You're angry with your friend. Your, real, your anger reality, your friend's reality. Your reality is anger. Your friend's reality is confusion. 
You think, if you think that your reality is real, is reality, it's only that. That's why people don't understand each other. Why don't you understand my reality? And if the friend only believes his reality, oh, I'm confused, then can't understand the angry friend. So if you see that both of them are empty, that mind is empty, and that your particular reality is also empty, that is the meaning of samadhi, which means not moving mind. So anger, angry time, angry. Sad time, sad. Happy time, happy. Laughing time, laughing. If you're not attached to them, and if you fundamentally know that they are empty, even as you experience them, that's the point, that's the only difference. If you think that they're real, you, you attach to them. Then you suffer. It stays with you. You carry it. You don't put it down unless they put theirs down. You don't let it go unless you're sure they're letting theirs go. Until then, I'm going to hold it, my anger. But what are you holding? It's not real. It's not unreal. It's empty. When you realize that, then anger is just anger. Sadness is just sadness. Fear is just fear. Happiness is just happiness. You're free in any situation while being human. That's the point of this. When the sentient being mind appears, Buddhahood disappears. When the sentient mind disappears, Buddhahood appears. When mind appears, reality disappears. When mind disappears, reality appears. Whoever knows that nothing depends on anything Whoever knows that nothing depends on anything has found the way. Nothing depends on anything. That means no conditions. There's no conditions. There's no conditions. We always make it in our mind. This will happen if that. I'll feel this if that. Conditions. But if you realize that all conditions are fundamentally empty, that is finding the way finding your way. And whoever knows that mind depends on nothing is always at the place of enlightenment. So that is the uh, conclusion of this teaching. Actually, there's too many words. This is too much talking. Too much speaking. All of this only goes back to one point. It only goes back to Looking inside, looking at mind, not using your thinking to look at mind, not looking at mind as an object, looking, what am I? Don't look at your thinking, what am I? When you look at that, when you look inside, what asked what am I? Who is looking at what am I? Who heard that? <coughs> Who? What? When you look. In Chinese characters, Hui Guang Ban Zhou. Following your mind light. Looking in. Not outside to objects, things, feelings, perceptions, experiences, memories. Not this outside game, show, movie, dream, shadow world. Not that. But where does that perception come from? Who sees it? Look. When you look, when you look, when you look, there's nothing there. I'm going to upside. Absolutely nothing there. That's it. That is our study. So all of these words, 
for the last couple of weeks are only pointing to that. What am I? Not an understanding of that, not a concept of that, not a philosophy of that. Buddhism is actually looking, actually seeing. Then, realizing that's empty, attaining that, then using that. It's not a thing. Using that experience to save all beings from suffering. So, I want to thank everyone for attending these talks for the last couple of weeks. All you have to do now, you've had too much preparation, too much talking, too much. Bodhidharma would beat me. Buddha would beat me. Sung San, Dei San Sanin would really beat me. Just do it. Every day, 10 minutes, just 10 minutes sitting. What am I? That's all. That's the point of this teaching. If you do that, something very interesting happens. You see, absolutely nothing there. Then, nothing can harm you. Nothing can move you. Nothing can control you. Nothing can trap you. Nothing can kill you. Nothing to pray to. Nothing to be afraid of. Only, what am I? Just look inside then something becomes clear, because it's already clear. So I hope everybody, moment to moment, moment to moment to moment to moment to moment, walking, standing, lying down, moving or being still, in all cases and in all moments, what am I? That's the nature of this teaching, that's the nature of Bodhidharma's speech, that's the, name of, that's the nature of Buddha's teaching, all Buddhist teachings. Everyone, from moment to moment, just do it. Thank you very much.